Uh, my name is Mitchell Davis. I'm the executive vice president of the James Beard Foundation, which is an organization in New York City devoted to shaping America's food culture, um, whether it be through gastronomy and the role that chefs play, through innovative solutions to food system challenges, um, or by instilling in uh, our food culture in the United States, the values that we know to be true um, and important, uh, the sustainability of our food, the healthfulness and wholesomeness of our food, uh, and the equitable access we have to food. We're going to treat today's um, segment a little bit differently from some of the others that have we've enjoyed this week so far at this amazing gathering, Seeds and Chips. Uh, and I'm going to start with a few introductory comments uh, and then we're going to have a conversation with some experts about food waste and sustainability just to set the stage a little bit for the issues we're talking about, to expand a little bit on what Clara said in her introductory remarks. And then uh, we're going to hear some case studies of companies um, that range in scale from among the largest, one of the largest food companies in the world, down to an innovative tech solution to the food waste issue. And I hope in that process, while we grow the conversation here on stage, that we'll, we'll really uncover uh, not just um, the challenges, but the opportunities from a business sense, from an environmental sense, and from a social responsibility sense. So then so, we are going to have a panel conversation, as I said at the beginning, with a few people to talk a little bit more deeply about this issue and some of the solutions. We're going to see some case studies. We're going to invoke, um, because this is the Conference on Technology and Innovation, technology and innovation, uh, and we're going to talk about a really important question of scale with some of our, our speakers today. Um, and while we do that, I'm going to, we're going to have on a loop on the, on the screen some slides that have some interesting uh, facts, um, sharp, striking facts, in addition to the ones that I've, I've given you already, um, that will, uh, I think, illuminate the global uh, impact and the global um, issue of food waste. So, if I will ask my first two panelists to join me um, on stage, I'm going to uh, welcome Devin Clattel, who is the Associate Director of the Rockefeller Foundation. She's leading their work um, to prevent wasted food in the United States, obviously, um, and, uh, but as part of the Foundation's Global Yieldwise Initiative, which seeks to eliminate enormous environmental, social, and economic costs caused by food waste. Come, please, Devin. Uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to have a conversation. And also, Mark Buckley, who is a consultant and an entrepreneur. Uh, we got to do the dramatic music. Come, Mark. Come, come, come. I'll do it. Please. So, yes, okay. It's either going or it's not. Join me here. Great. Uh, and Mark, so Mark is a consultant uh, and an environmentalist. Uh, and he um, is the uh, CEO and co-founder of Anja, which is, uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? Anya, sorry, I'm not. Uh, sustainable food and beverage production company. So I want to start with you, Devin. Give us a little bit about the, the, uh, why the Rockefeller Foundation, a tremendously influential and important philanthropic organization, um, really operating in, the, in many different public spaces, chose to come into the food waste conversation. Sure. Thanks, Mitchell. And um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I think the reason that the Rockefeller Foundation has chosen to focus on food waste and loss is because of a lot of the impacts that you're probably seeing circle on the screen right now in the form of statistics, which is that food waste has such an enormous impact on our environment, on the economics, not only at a sort of systems level nationally and, and businesses, but also of smallholder farmers and producers that are often losing much of their product to loss and waste. And then, of course, there's the social impacts of the fact that we have in the United States, I think it's now one in seven Americans are food insecure. We have a massive number of um, hungry people throughout the world, and yet we're throwing away a huge percentage of food. So the Rockefeller Foundation has a long history of working in agriculture and um, sort of famously promoting a lot of the work around the Green Revolution that was very focused on production. And I think part of the realization we've come to is that focusing on production is no longer sufficient if we're throwing away 30 to 40 percent of what we produce, and that we feel like regardless of what you care about when it comes to sustainable food, if you're wasting such an enormous amount of the food being produced, then um, you're not gonna be able to achieve those sort of long-term sustainability, social, economic, and environmental goals. So for us, we really saw it as an opportunity to have multiple positive impacts across the system. Interesting. Mark, 
from a business perspective, uh, obviously, uh, I went to business school. You learn not to waste things in business school. <laughs> that that that's, doesn't really help your bottom line. How can we? How can we, with some of these statistics, $218 billion worth of waste, um, how do we get, how does that happen? Really, on a, on a finite planet, um, it, it just doesn't make economic sense to continue growth and production at the rate that we have mixed with the amounts of waste we have. And so, our business models as an entrepreneurs, we really need to change our models to be sustainable models. And I don't want to talk about sustainability as a greenwashing or a term that just everyone throws out there. It needs to be built deep into the model so that when you produce products, they're thought out uh, with how does this product be created so that it doesn't become waste, so that it's part of your model with the energy, water, and, and uh, food nexus all thought of in one system and built into your business models so that you don't have this waste in the first place. And, and can I, from an economic standpoint, one, one of, often, partly we waste things because they have no value. And how do, is it, I'm asking both of you this, we find ourselves in a situation where food has so little value that we can even afford to discard 40% of it. Using that oil, yeah, using that oil as, as an example, which we just would never pour crude oil. Well, sometimes we do, but that's an accident. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about food waste is that it's often the result, I think, of good intentions. So I haven't come across sort of a pro-food waste lobby. Um, <laughs> there aren't a lot of folks out there that are promoting waste food, food waste. Right. Um, I think often it's the result of individual decisions made by actors along the supply chain that are trying to do the best for themselves and for their businesses. So farmers are trying to create the best product for their buyers. Um, I think grocery stores, hotels and restaurants are trying to serve the best product to their customers and customers are trying to um, often express sort of love and Obama, President Obama said joy yesterday through food. And I think that in many cases, food waste has become sort of business as usual along that supply chain. And to a large extent, it's become invisible to a lot of those actors and they're, so they're making decisions and they're not necessarily taking into account the issue of food waste and so at least in the, in the US where a lot of the waste is due to consumer behavior consumer facing businesses I think part of the fight we're fighting here is, is almost a fight against sort of invisibility and indifference mm. um, trying to make people aware of the problem trying to get them to start measuring the food waste trying to get them to think proactively around managing it as a resource and sort of revaluing food um, and, and treating it as precious as many of us have come to treat water, energy, and other resources. I, I do just want to say that we're, we're sort of using the, the term food waste here broadly. Right. Um, at the Rockefeller Foundation, we see the global problem of food waste sort of taking two fairly different forms. So there's um, sort of uh, the, in the discarding of, of waste that's often due to sort of consumer preferences and aesthetics and um, other issues that we see as a main driver in the US. And then there's the issue of loss, which um, tends to happen in less developed supply chain where a lot of the opportunity is really around creating infrastructure, better storage and processing and harvesting. And there, I think um, it's probably, behavior change is still crucial but it's less uh, about sort of consumer preferences and often more around fairly simple technologies, connecting farmers to markets and providing access to capital for them to change the way they operate. So I just think we need to, we need to think about both sides of the right. equation when we think about tackling it at a global level. So just to summarize, loss happens on the way to market, let's say, and waste happens once the consumer or the consumption is involved. I think so, and I, I hesitate to, to to project intentionality, but I think loss often feels unavoidable. Um, things spoil or things um, get damaged because they just don't have the right. transport and, right. and crates and those kinds of things. I think waste, um, while maybe not unintentional, is, is at some level sort of a choice that we make. Uh, so we often hear talk of these, this imperative to make food as cheap as possible, which certainly in the United States is part of the, the conversation around food. And 
and in some ways gets that issue I began with, the equitability of food. And yet we also hear, to your point, Mark, that uh, we aren't paying enough for food because the externalities are not built into that economic system, or the economic model of food. Could you comment on that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's kind of what I'm, it's very complex. So it's, sure. we're using the food waste very broad. Um, there's so many factors, and I believe the factor starts in the creation by agriculture, by food production, where we, before it's even packaged or be even presented to someone, that we're already thinking about how can we extend the life of this product, how can we make sure that it doesn't get thrown away. And that's where fair trade, true cost, fair wages, uh, that's where we really pay the true cost of a product. That means the energy, the water, the uh, total production, marketing, logistics, and transport goes into that. And so retail plays a big portion of that. Uh, up until recently, France is a big example. They just said, you know, we, we're not going to throw food away at a grocery store. If, if there's produce left, we're going to give it to the poor and homeless. We're going to make sure it gets used. We're going to uh, put it to use instead of throwing it away. That's no longer good to just throw your food away and so that's one aspect to help with food waste but it's really about that fair um, pricing if it's really cheap it's easier to buy a couple extras and um, then if they spoil it's not that big of a deal but really it's then becomes a 10x waste so you're not only wasting that food you're wasting the energy packaging water that went into producing that food and so uh, many faceted education, but we really need to begin at the beginning of how food is brought to us. It's Devin, given the um, importance of feeding everybody, uh, and as you mentioned, we have this funny paradox where there's a lot of waste and there's a lot of hunger. Um, but we also have that conversation that I think was so poignant from uh, President Obama yesterday that in a situation where people don't have enough um, leads to some political consequences. And, and the, the answer of taking the waste from one and feeding the hungry in another seems like a tense dialogue. Could you comment a little bit on the relationship between that waste and, and hunger? I mean. Not to put you on the spot, but you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think um, maybe the first thing to say on that is I don't think anyone's suggesting that we sort of literally take the food from, uh, you know, our lunch today and, and somehow send it to folks that are, don't have enough food in other parts of the world. Although and when we were little, we heard that a lot. We did. <laughs> right? We heard that a lot. We heard that a lot. Um, I, I think the reality is today our food system is global, and so the idea that is is that in a global marketplace, if we as sort of as Americans, as an example, collectively are consuming less and sort of wasting less along the way, that that would make more wholesome food available to others on the global market. So I don't think it's a direct one-to-one. -one. Um, I do think that we need to think really hard and really carefully around equity and inclusion when it comes to these kinds of issues. And I think that that's something that I would encourage everyone who's you know, here at this conference to think about, particularly when we start talking about innovation and technology and making sure that some of the new solutions are available to um, different types of people all around the world mm -hmm. um, when it comes to reducing waste. Because again, I think if we're using waste in the broadest terms, reduction of waste can benefit producers as well. And often those producers, to your point, Mark, about going back to the beginning of the supply chain, are smallholder farmers. I mean, that's the majority of farmers around the world. So when we're talking about reducing waste, we're also talking about trying to put money back into the pockets of those farmers, trying to secure their own livelihoods and, and trying to, in many cases, help their own food security. Right. So I think we need to think about that piece of the equation as well. Um, and I, I totally agree that thinking about these issues from the very beginning is sort of the best place to, to intervene. Right. There's some old farming practices called gleaning where basically the products that can't be sold to the grocery are basically gleaned off and given to the local community. They're cooked, they're dehydrated because it's okay to process ugly food if it's not visible or being yeah. seen as if it's transformed. And so there are methods out there, but we've kind of forgotten that a little bit. And then there's other processes that where the farms or agriculture ships that 
to the border to go to the U.S., to go to uh, other countries, and it's turned away at the border, and instead of sending it back to the farm or to the country that has starving and, uh, and hungry people, it's disposed of at the border because it's ugly fruit, the curve isn't right, it's not long enough, uh, things like that. And so we really want to think of that as well, but it's many faceted, very complex. Sure. So. And, and let's, in the few minutes we have left for this part of the program, let's switch to what we heard so much talk about yesterday also, and that is the impact of food production and by extension food waste or loss on climate change, um, something that we don't always associate. It's hard enough to imagine um, how what I eat or don't eat will impact those who are hungry, but how I will eat and, or don't eat impacts the planet and the climate and the environment in the next 20 years, I think is a, a bigger switch. Could, could you comment a little bit on the role that waste plays or the wastefulness of food production? Sure, I mean, I think we heard a lot yesterday from uh, Sam Cass and President Obama about the the just extractive nature of food production generally around the world when it comes to water and land use and all the fertilizers and other inputs that we put into food and the fact that we're then throwing away not not just 40 percent of those inputs but also all the other resources which i think you alluded to mark that are used to transport and process and package that food when it gets to sort of the end of its life is is a massive um drain on the planet i think one of the lesser known facts about food waste is that food in landfills is a massive emitter of methane and other greenhouse gases. And I think people just don't know enough about that. People often assume that throwing food away, um, that it'll sort of decompose in a landfill the same way it might in a compost bin. Uh, you mentioned the Wasted documentary, which we're very excited to have premiered a, a couple of weeks ago at Tribeca. And one of the most shocking parts for viewers of that movie, I think, is that they sort of do a beat on the street segment where they interview folks and ask them how long they think it takes a head of lettuce to decompose in a landfill. And it takes 25 years for a head oh. of lettuce. So I, I just think people, again, it's sort of a visibility issue. People don't think about what happens to the food once it gets disposed of, but that's actually one of the, the major environmental drivers. And I would just say one thing we're finding in our work in the US with not just with companies, but also with cities and, and municipalities is that as cities are starting to get to GHG goals and other goals, they're increasingly looking to managing food waste as one um, opportunity area around that. So Can you say what a GHG goal is? Greenhouse gas emission goal. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, Mark, thoughts about the, the climate piece of this? Uh, yeah, the, the biggest thing is uh, we talk a lot about fossil fuels and how that's the energy is the big impactor for climate change. And, and really, um, the stats are out that every human eats, every, everybody needs food, um, and agriculture, food and beverage production is really, truly the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and the cause of climate change, the, uh, more so than the energy factor, because you now figure in it affects our health, it affects our diet, obesity, asthma, but also the logistics. We're using fossil fuels to transport those goods, shipping, trucking. We're not using clean energy. And so it's really one of the major imp impacts that y every person touches in the world, whether you're poor or whether you're in a developed country that, that has great food options. And so um, it's, it's much more complex than we really know. And, and the uh, 10x factor of methane gases is one aspect. Then there's um, a animal production, uh, uh, or uh, there's many things to address. But we really need to take a strong focus or look at uh, food waste, food production, to make sure we're seeing what impacts are truly occurring for climate change in that respect. Thank you. So a round of applause, I guess, for this portion of the conversation. And thank you to my panelists. I'm not going to let you go yet, though, uh, because I want to bring now to the stage uh, someone to tell a story, really, about a company operating or trying to find these sorts of efficiencies at the largest level, one of the largest food companies in the world, in fact. Um, um, I, I'll take a few minutes, since we can't do audience questions, uh, just to continue the conversation. You have said so many provocative things. Um, and important things. And uh, one thing I want to ask, you mentioned that there's an imperative for farmers to participate um, and the response is, is so positive. 
is this, what you've just described, is this something the consumer needs to know? The consumer will support, and by that, of course, we mean pay another penny or another five cents or whatever it is that we're talking about. And if not, how, do, how can we help motivate that change, that push? So I, I think if you, you know, if you generally look into this, consumers in general all will tell you, yes, I want more sustainable food, I want to... Um, make sure everybody has an equitable uh, return, etc. No question, nobody will di disagree with that. We have a, another challenge though, and I, I think you touched on it. In the US alone, there are somewhere between 50 to 60 million Americans who are now living on subsidized food. About 30 million are on welfare, what we call SNAP, or food stamps, another 10 to 20 million for, based on charities. When a fifth of our population is living on subsidized food, which is, by the way, $4 per meal per day, $4, you know what? The question you asked, unfortunately, is not at the top of their mind. And somehow, we, the experts, live in our bubble of what is, quote, right for the world. I've had the chance of going down, and I used to practice medicine in, a, in an inner city as well. You actually sit down with a mother who's got three kids and she's got $12 to feed her three children. It's a different question on top of her mind. Right. And that's what we have to crack. How do we educate, but also, how do we provide, you know, accessibility food to food is not just available on the supermarket shelf, not. but can they actually buy it? The same problem is true, I'm sure, across many cities in Europe the United Kingdom, and of course, people think of this access issue as an emerging world problem. It's happening in our cities. And I guess in some ways I wonder, does it even matter? Because were you able to find the efficiencies you've described the, to sustain the model? I, one of the imperatives I know for large food companies in the environmental issues is you need to ensure a supply chain 25 years from now, not just the logistics and distribution network, is there a way that it, no one needs to know, that you need to do that anyway? Is that, is that something from a corporate standpoint, a publicly traded company can, can decide this is how we must operate regardless of that response? Look, there's two reasons why we have to do this. One, if you're in this for a long-term viable business, without access to water, land, and an environment that's conducive to sustained growth of, of everything about food is agriculture, we cannot operate. So one is a necessity. The other actually, even in the short to medium term, is financial. We've saved hundreds of millions of dollars just through water efficiency. That's to our bottom line. So at PepsiCo, sustainability is not a function that lives in our reputational communications or government affairs or public policy. I had it up as the head of R&D, head of innovation, it is core to the way in which we operate. It is not an adjacency. And to, er, to Mark's earlier point, if it isn't part of how you operate through the core, it won't happen. It can't just be a department that lives on the side and jumps up and down and says, we have to do this if no one's committed. You know, I'll give you a quick example. Somebody asked me, who, you know, where is your sustainability committee at PepsiCo? <laughs> You're right. Okay? I said, let me tell you who the sustainability committee, because I, I, I am chair. Now, let me tell you who's the sustainability committee. It is the executive board of the company. Right. That is the sustainability committee. We have done away with the, quote, sustainability committee. When you make it the sustainability committee's responsibility, right. it is somebody else's responsibility. Right. We do have a board sustainability committee, which is the corporate board, but the executive board of the company, the executive team, is the sustainability committee. Devin? So um, you touched a little bit on the issue in the U.S. at least that uh, we have a significant chunk of the population that's food insecure and often those are families and, and children and we also know that we have an increasing health and obesity crisis in the U.S. and in other developed markets and one thing we think about when we think about food waste is that often foods that are wasted tend to be more perishable, healthier foods like produce and, and fruits, vegetables and even meat and dairy. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how Pepsi is thinking about some of these issues in the context of, of sort of health and um, that issue of equity when it comes to healthy and wholesome foods as well. It's a great question, something that we've been thinking about and as a medical physician, I've thought about many years before I came to PepsiCo. 
Those of you who don't know me in the audience, I'm an endocrinologist and practice at the Mayo Clinic in diabetes and metabolic disease for many years. And so very much in that field. One of the challenges, and I think it was the University of Chicago that came up with the, the coined the term food deserts. And in most of the cities in the U.S., you will find areas, and I'm sure in Europe too, where there are these food deserts. Part of the challenge is the cost and logistics and the purchasing power of the local residents. It doesn't allow a financial model where food can be delivered of the spectrum that is available in suburbs in more affluent suburbs. So that's the problem. You know that, we know that. I'm not sure that anybody has solved it, but let me tell you how we're looking at this. We've looked at it in two ways. One is a program we started called Food for Good. The White House represent, uh, recognized this program as the best of its kind a couple of years ago. One of our employees came up with the observation that during the summer, school children living in these inner cities actually no longer get a, me a full meal all day. Because their full whole meal during the school year is actually the school lunch. When the 12 weeks of summer come, they lose it. <clears throat> but we are distributing, and our drivers are there. So we developed a portfolio of food, dairy, fruits, of course, grains, that was USDA certified, and started delivering this to those inner cities, and we call the program Food for Good. We started in one city, and we had a few 10,000 meals delivered. Five years later, we're in more than a dozen cities in the US. We have 10 million plus meals delivered, and demand is continuing to grow with amazing engagement of our employees, because many of them are volunteers, amazing capability of these drivers who drive for us in the summer, who've now progressed from that to becoming full-time employees. They've developed a work schedule. And the other is the R&D team has been working to figure out low-cost innovation that can bring the cost of cooling, because you've got to deliver this, you know, in the middle of July in Dallas, it's hot. And so how do you get dairy without a refrigerated truck? Because the system can't, that's one example. Others, I hope, and we're now looking and talking with a European, couple of European country governments to try and bring that program now outside the US. It's a pilot, but it's already much bigger than what you might think about as a pilot. So that's the giving into the community. On the commercial side, we launched a program called Food for, sorry, uh, called Hello Goodness. You'll see it displayed. The challenge we had there was, look, we know how to do vending machines. The problem with vending machines, of course, is you can put shelf-stable products in there, but the healthier products need a cool distribution system, but also a cooler that allows it. But you, these places can't afford multiple coolers. So we designed the vending capability that will house mixtures of products. So we put Sabra hummus in there. Mm -hmm. We put whole grain products in there, Quaker products in there, juice in there, along with the upper end a mixture so that now you've got options yeah. in these inner cities because many times instead of a grocery store, these people are shopping at the gas station. Can we put some access, and we call that program Hello Goodness. It's the first step. I can tell you without disclosing, we have version two already under development, version three under development, and it's not just a little show and tell. We committed to rolling out 20,000 of those machines in these food access limited pro mm. areas. Fascinating. Another round of applause, I think, for Dr. Khan. What an interesting <laughs> and important work. And now so in, in the last few minutes, um, I'd like us to try to have not quite an easy conversation with so many people, but, but we heard a lot of similar themes from the very beginning. We, uh, as we have some feedback, we hear, yeah. We heard um, the need to be thinking about uh, from the very beginning of a production model or a business plan or, or uh, an idea to grow anything, what we're going to do to alleviate waste throughout the system. We heard the value of shining a spotlight on the waste so that people um, in that system or who consume those products are, are cognizant of the issue. We heard the value of data and logistics in trying to work that out and also this idea of, of full use, of, of reimagining what is the food part and what is the waste part because it's ugly 
badly or it's lying somewhere. I'm wondering if we might comment, uh, since this is really an entrepreneur's gathering, uh, Seeds and Chips, um, where in those systems do you, from your perspective, see the opportunities for things you need, in addition to the solutions you've created, where do you think there are opportunities for this audience to, to help along that long process, that long chain, um, the ecosystem of food production uh, to minimize waste? Where should I start? I'm going to start with you, Mark. Um, so, I think we're in a, um, a, a, a boom that's kicking off in the area of food waste and entrepreneurship. Um, just the fundamental fact that it's about a trillion dollars a year of food that we throw away, um, that is a massive resource that we should be taking advantage of. Um, and I think that the more entrepreneurs that rush into this space, the better and the faster we're going to drive innovation. Um, I think it needs to be coupled, um, as Dr. Khan said, with large businesses taking bold steps to move quickly. Um, because I honestly don't think we have as much time as it will naturally take for that to for that to come to fruition. I think the you know I've worked in food my entire life, everywhere from food wholesale um, at McKinsey doing work in um, you know manufacturing and retail and elsewhere. Um, I think there are opportunities literally across the entire supply chain. Um, what I know the most about is that there are areas in warehousing where food um, gets stuck because ads are miscalculated or because products get discontinued and being able to sell that product in an easy way is a market that can be created. And so I think that there's a general theme around creating markets for food that would have otherwise been wasted to prevent that. And there are examples of that today of companies like Too Good To Go that are selling food um, at restaurants that they would have otherwise thrown away. Um, there are startups looking up the supply chain to do that. And I think that's just a great opportunity to create efficiency. I also think those companies can grow quickly because every company wants to chase away to sort of drive more revenue, which is a, which is a positive aspect of that. I think there are tremendous opportunities in efficiency um, we focus on commercial kitchens because they're basically run on pen and paper. They're the most populous, basic, if you think about it, the most populous factory in the world um, and run the same way that we used to run them back in the dark ages. Um, and so there's a tremendous opportunity for technology to come in there and drive change. But where I think the most change needs to be driven, but we are seeing the least innovation is actually in the home. You know, in the U.S., 40% of the food that is wasted goes into the home or com com comes from the home. It's the exact same thing in other developed markets. It is waste. It is a choice. And the reason I say that is because in emerging markets, what they buy, they typically eat. <laughs> and so that's not the problem that they have. But ways to make consumers more aware of what they're wasting, ways to drive better purchasing patterns, ways to reward people for making the right buying decisions um, is a mass opportunity if someone can crack that. Um, and I think it's, it would be exciting when I see that. Uh, other opportunities you see along that system? Comments? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think to the point that you just made and something that um, Sam Cass and Barack Obama spoke about yesterday is we have a huge opportunity to educate people. And I think that as a very small but mighty startup that I'm in and hearing, you know, some of the bigger initiatives that are going on with the biggest companies on the globe, there's a really interesting place where the consumers now that are growing up, they're younger and they're making buying decisions and they're influencing their parents, those are the consumers we're all looking to communicate with. And they care about these things. They care about these issues. And if we can get the younger people to really understand it, even if it's as simple as a compact fluorescent light bulb was to the environmental movement 10 years ago, and then stages beyond that, that's where these things start to make impact. And it can happen quickly. And if we work within the educational systems and we work within the homes, I think that that becomes really interesting. And we can, together, you know, that's where this combination of entrepreneurial thinking, design thinking, engineering, problem solving, and the bigger companies have huge opportunity. Maybe just to add, um, uh, to build on what's been said, a couple of other examples. Again, thinking about the entrepreneur. If you think about the post-consumer waste in the developed world, we throw away most of our food because we think it's expired. Mm -hmm. There's a date there, and heaven knows, no matter what I tell my wife about that date, when it hits that, she's not feeding it to our grandchild. 
it's done. And yeah, it doesn't mean say the day before it was fine and the day after it's no longer fit for human consumption. We have to rethink everything from the regulatory aspect of what that date means to ultimately the date depends on how the food was handled and stored, okay? We have a uniform blan blanket approach to this, we no longer can. Modern technology should be able to tell us if that product is still viable or not. We can do it, it can be done. It's like the farm example I gave you. The technology exists, do we have the mindset and the will to implement it? That's one. Can we bring the entrepreneurs together? On the emerging market side, again, 60% of the mango crop at the Cape of, Cape, uh, the Horn of Africa, sorry, 60% rots. This is a part of the world that cannot afford, it, it is starving. Two thirds of their harvest rots. Surely we can figure out a way to extend that harvest either through breeding, stabilize that harvest, or get it out into the hands of the consumers in the region. Now, you might call that social entrepreneurship, but these are great potential markets. Entrepreneurs will figure it out. I have no doubt when they look at that problem, imagine 60% of something that's edible, has nutrients, everything, in a starving community, rotting away. Tragic. That is tragic. Although there are examples uh, of places where, because we don't all consider food the same things, m markets that, that export, that ship, the, the Great Potato Famine, where people uh, were uh, unable to feed themselves because of the culture uh, of, of what, what they experienced or what they were used to. And I would just like to end on an optimistic note. Um, and, and for the young people, whoever they are, um, our teen evaders, for instance, um, what can they do to help move this move us to the goals that we've set as a global community, reducing waste, but even more so um, making um, more equitable, productive, delicious, wholesome food as, as young individuals, not just entrepreneurs. And let's just go around a few words for everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are amazing innovations in food science, and there are a ton of new ingredients, many of which can be waste from companies and production of other types of things that we've spoken about, that is like really accessible matter to play with and solve with and invent with. And I think that just looking at those two things alone is very exciting. Devin? <clears throat> First of all, I have to say I'm massively impressed with the teen innovators, and I think um, that their presence here alone has made me very optimistic. I would say one thing you can do is keep asking the questions. So the same way that we've been taught to ask questions in recent years about where food comes from and sourcing policies, I think we need to start asking questions about what companies, restaurants, businesses, others are doing with excess food. So when you go to a restaurant, ask, do they compost? When you go to a hotel, ask, do they have a food donation program? I think just by asking the question, you're helping to raise the level of consciousness around the dialogue um, with the businesses and, and other stakeholders that you interact with. And, and as you started with, I think, Mitchell, a lot of this, at least in the US, is a cultural issue. And I think we need to start shifting that conversation. Dr. Khan. I would say ask questions for sure, challenge assumptions, which I generally, I think this young generation is very good at. And I would add, though, be non-judgmental. If you take a judgmental position without truly understanding the complexities, there will be no progress. But if you challenge, ask questions, and be non-judgmental and engage, then we'll see progress. Important. Mark? I agree. Uh, ask a lot of questions, a lot of whys. But take a systemic approach, really an inclusive approach that not just your city, your country, but realize that some of your food might come from another country, another neighborhood, another region of the world, and that we're actually all in this together. We all eat food and from all different places of the world, and, and so we need a really complex, dynamic solution, multiple solutions with many players that are basically global citizens, global countries, global um, individuals that are coming together, working together, and not capsuling themselves off in walls and borders and nations, but working together to solve the problem. 
that's a lot about education and really asking the question why let's apply then innovations that are already in existence and then if they don't work let's move to some innovations but uh, there's a lot of things that have been around for a long time that we've never put into use if we did we'd already see immediate 50 percent innovations 50 percent improvements so and mark if you've got an idea and you've got something that you want to build go go build it um and you know my my encouragement on that it just comes from the fact that this is such a large problem. I mean, food waste, as Tristram Stewart, who was one of the original people that highlighted this issue, very wisely said, food waste is the vulnerable underbelly of our food system. It's something that everybody agrees is broken, but there's a whole lot about our food system that has to evolve over the next 20 to 30 years. And um, going and building something that's going to address that um, is an enormous opportunity. Um, I think it's a great time to be a young person to go on and build that. Um, if you don't have an idea, but you're still passionate about the issue, commit and really just get involved um, because there's a lot of work to do and the young energy that you guys have is something that's desperately needed. Well, I want to thank you for a fascinating conversation, an important conversation, and thank you for all the work that you do to help change. It's a big world out there. There's a lot of food and a lot of people, and on behalf of all of them, really, thank you all.